Father, again, we just we stand in your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. We're just thankful for uh, the privilege that you've given us the opportunity to not only fellowship, but to feast upon your word. May the Holy Spirit be the one that teaches us. We are so keenly aware of just how little we know and how immense is this book, your word. I just ask that you would filter out all the foolishness and all of the ignorance, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com and we're continuing on in our studies through Romans, verse by verse. And in our last study together, we were in chapter 4, about uh, the verse, about somewhere around verse four, 17, verse 17. Uh, so I think this study will begin around the neighborhood of, of verse 17. So that's the Epistle to the Romans, uh, chapter 4, verse 17. We had just begun to look at verse 17 in the previous video. Uh, begun to look at 17 through verse 25. Romans 4, verse 17. And the Holy Spirit has clearly laid out man's total depravity. And I've mentioned this. I think in, in each one of these studies uh, recently that the church has in the main departed from the biblical theological issue, or I should say biblical theological truth, of man's total depravity. And by total depravity, I mean that man is unable to remedy the condition of sin in which he exists, and that God did. And we've looked at those theological concepts at different times. So the Holy Spirit has devastated man's attempt by his own works and his own goodness to gain favor with God. And then we began in the middle of the third chapter with a marvelous revelation that that though that they though they had all sinned and come short of the glory of God they were justified freely by his grace. And modern missionary activity has taken Romans 3:23 and and totally disassociated it from the context. All of God's people sinned and come short of the glory of God. Not one, not a, not a Moses, not a Daniel, not an Abraham, not an Isaiah, not an Elijah, not one single one of God's chosen people ever, ever reached the glory of God. They all sinned and came short of the glory of God. However, they were justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This is what our text is teaching us. You can't take a phrase out of a sentence and reach conclusions which are anti-biblical. All of God's children who sinned and came short of the glory of God were justified without a cause by His grace, freely by His grace, freely by His grace, justified. The word means made righteous. And we looked at the result of that justification. We looked at the fact that Abraham was in a family of idol worshipers and God called him alone. Didn't call a family, didn't call his brother, didn't call his father. He called Abraham 
alone. And we've looked at the result of that call in Abraham's life. I pointed out to you that when we reach the eighth chapter, if we get there, whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, and those whom he did predestinate, he called, and those whom he called, he justified. So Abraham was called and justified in God's process freely by God's grace. The result of that is that he believed God. The person who occurs most frequently in the Word of God, I don't know if you knew this or not, is Abraham. If you list all of the, the human names, there's nobody except for Jesus, who is God and man, but no human that holds a candle to Abraham. His name occurs many, many, many times more than any other name. I always thought Sarah was a pretty name, and so I actually named one of our sweetest uh, little white rabbits Sarah because we arranged her so that she would not be bred. Now, I mean, I'm fairly sure she's barren. I hope some of you are laughing at that. That's a true story, but her name doesn't appear very often. And there's got to be a reason why the Holy Spirit has emphasized Abraham in the Word of God 216 times at my count that I Jesus occurs 935 times I believe that reason is clear and that is that Abraham is a picture of how God works in the lives of his people and Abraham is a picture of how we are responsible members of the body of Christ and how responsible members of the body of Christ should respond. There are two sides to this coin that, that, that sometimes get easily confused. You need to understand we have absolutely, absolutely no, zero responsibility to be born again. The obligation of being born again never rested on the baby. Never did. So there's absolutely no obligation or work involved in your redemption. But there is a responsibility in your salvation. There is no doubt. I mean, the scriptures declare without a doubt. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Many people use that as an evangelistic verse. It's to believers who are already saved. Thy faith made thee whole. And I can go on and on with passages of Scripture. That's very clear. The astounding thing, to me, the astounding thing is how without thought, without any logic, without any serious thinking, Christians have said, well, that means redemption, and it doesn't. God does not depend upon, nor does he wait upon, a dead man's decision to resurrect him to life. And it boggles every mind of every believer who is come to know this to be true, how that any Christian, young or old, could not see likewise. But it, it really probably shouldn't astound us that much. Man was gifted with the greatest gifts of reason and logic more than any other creature ever created. And yet he stumbles at this most important, most vital fact. Why? Why? It's clearly a testimony to God's wisdom. 
because it goes contrary to natural thinking. It is a validation of the work of the Holy Spirit to enlighten. It's his job. That's his work. It is proof of man's inability to understand spiritual truth apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. A confirmation of the truth of the inability of the natural man to discern that which is good, to discern that which is spiritual. Not even the, the Christian can discern that which is spiritual unless God reveals it to him. I don't I don't reveal anything to anybody. That's his job. Folks, you were redeemed because Jesus Christ died for you. And much of the family in the household of God is one sorry-looking group of redeemed people. Sorry to have to tell you that, but it's true. Many, many years ago, we had an older friend who was involved in teaching Scripture. He was involved in teaching the Word of God, and I mentioned to him one time, that it almost seemed to me that some kids were better in their theology. And, and I named somebody, not going to mention the name, I named somebody. And he put his arm around my shoulder and he said, Steve, one thing you're going you're gonna to have to realize all your life is that God's people are a sorry lot. Now, I don't mean to sound condescending, and I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm trying to say here. I believe God has emphasized Abraham so that we might see both sides of that picture. That Abraham had no responsibility in being called. Folks, he didn't go to Abraham and he didn't say, you know, would you like to be called? You know, I've been thinking about calling somebody and, uh, you know, hey, you look like a likely candidate. Why would Abraham look like a likely candidate? I mean, was he handsome? You know, was he strong? Was he good? You know, there must have been something in Abraham that led God to call him, right? Absolutely wrong. If you believe that, then you don't understand the Word of God. It's not of works. If it's of works, it's not grace. There wasn't a single thing in Abraham that led God to call him. Not a single thing. In the Gospel of John, we have the Lord coming. <clears throat> we have him coming to the pool of Bethesda, you know, a great throng of people there waiting for this mysterious angel to, to come down and trouble the waters. And the first one, now only the first one, in, is healed. I mean, you know, that must have been a real scramble. People trying to knock each other out is kind of how I imagine it, you know, trying to get in there. That's human works. And Christ said to one, one of them, take up thy bed and walk. What about all the others? You know, it must have been something in that guy, right? Something must have been something in that person that caused the Lord to do that, right? Wrong. What was in that individual was the fact that he was God's child. God doesn't love you because you're good, handsome, work hard. He loves you because you're his own. You know, that other kid may be great, but that kid is my kid. And, and God loved Abraham as he loves you 
because you are his child. Abraham was in a a family of idol worshipers, but he was God's child. God didn't call him because of anything Abraham did. And then he made him righteous. And that's exactly what he said in Romans chapter 8. And now this righteous man believed God. I got a little parakeet over here running around if you've if you're if you're hearing that. Jesus said, Why don't you believe me? You don't believe me because you're not my sheep. If you were my sheep, my sheep, you would hear my word. And somehow or other, the modern Christian church has turned it around dramatically, flipped it, up, flipped it on, on its head. They've said, that, they've said that if you hear, you'll become a sheep. When God says, if you're a sheep, you'll hear. And folks, that is a huge difference. However, now that, that God has elected and decreed the redemption of, of Abraham, Abraham suddenly has responsibilities that he never had before. And that is true in your experience, and that is true in mine. That, that's true in the Christian experience. You have responsibilities because you are God's child that you never, ever, ever had before. I've read numerous books on Christian responsibility that have been given me, and not one of those books has highlighted what I believe to be the primary responsibility of any Christian, and that is to believe God, to believe God. I've restated, I, I have repeated repeat I've stated repeatedly over the course of, of many years my belief that what Christ desires the most of us more than anything else is that we trust him is that we believe him that's what he desires more than anything from us I don't think that you have any responsibility that compares to it to believe God the righteous man shall live by the faithfulness of God. And all of a sudden we have a break. All of a sudden we have a break in the, in the theology that's being presented to us at verse 17 in chapter 4. We've seen man's total depravity. We've seen God move by grace and by grace alone. We've seen that that redemption is based upon the faithfulness of God as his children were we we see that as his children we were made sinners in Adam in the same way we were made righteous by the obedience of Christ not by our obedience but now all of a sudden since they are his child look at your text we're looking at Abraham they have certain responsibilities, and I believe God Almighty has given us a prime example in, in the text, in the Word of God, that it is possible to believe God. It is possible to live up to that responsibility, to simply trust Him, and that, I believe, is the other side of the Abraham picture. Abraham is a picture of God's elective decree, and Abraham is a picture of a faithful, redeemed individual in God's family. That's what we are looking at in the text. God declared that it's by faith, verse 16, in order that it might be by grace, 
If it were on any other basis, it couldn't be by grace. It'd be by pay. And then heaven would be a pretty sorry place. Heaven would be terrible. It's absolutely by the faithfulness of God that it might be by grace so that there's no merit. No merit in this at all. To the end that the promise is absolutely certain to all the seed. And that is a difficult concept to, for most Christians to grasp, particularly for anybody in the business world, because, well, you know, not just the business world and sports, I mean, you name it, because success is based upon the one who really performs, who really performed, who comes early, stays late, works hard. And that's just the natural conclusion that we have. It's how we were raised, folks, in this world. We promote people because they're good, because they perform, because they, we, otherwise we fire them. We get rid of them because they work. And it's only natural. It's only natural to conclude the promises that way. How, how, how many times I've had people say to me, Steve, well, don't you think God loves a person who tries more than he loves the one who doesn't try? I answer, no, he, he doesn't. It's not based on trying. It's based on grace. Trying would be reward. Pay. It's of grace. And the reason for that, the reason for that is so that the promise is absolutely certain to every single one of the seed. It is, it is the purest biblical truth to declare that not one of God's children will ever go to hell. I don't care what he does. Doesn't set very well with many folks to hear me say that. It's absolutely certain to all the seed, not only to that which is Abraham's descendant, but those who of of whom Abraham is their spiritual father, for he's the father of us all. He is the picture of the work of God in a new creation. As it is written, and this is, I, th I believe this is where I ended last time, I believe. I have made thee a father of many nations and I pointed out as Abraham stood before God and God made that statement to him Abraham was at that moment in time the father of many nations and he didn't have one child it's a, a perfect passive God declared it it's true he's the father of many nations and, and we begin in verse 17, the response of the regenerated individual Be, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickens the dead and calls those things that are not as though they were. Now, we can take we can take those expressions to mean a lot of things. Uh, he quickens the deadness of Abraham's body, or the, or he quickens the deadness of Sarah's womb. But much more than that. He quickens those who are spiritually dead. And he calls them new creations in Christ Jesus. It's God, 
folks, who knows the end from the beginning. It's he who can declare something certain that hasn't even happened yet. Who can name Cyrus years before he was ever born and became king. That's God. And so we begin in verse 17, down to verse 24, looking at the response of the Christian. I believe you have responsibility to believe God. And you will note he believed God in, in verse 17. Look, look at verse 17. He believed that which was spoken in verse 18. He believed the promise in verse 21. And the writing in verse 23, that's, that's the word of God. If there is any emphasized subject in this paragraph, it, it's the word of God. If there is anything that is, I find that interesting, we're talking about the Word of God in the Word of God. I mean, I want you to take a special note of how believing God is of obvious supreme importance in the next few verses. We are looking at the response of Abraham after God called him and justified it. Reading from the authorized version, since most of you, I know most of you like the King James Version, King James. I kind of vacillate between the, the King James and the New American Standard. New American Standards is, to me, easier reading. The King James, I believe, is more accurate to the original text. Hope against hope believed that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. In verse 20, he staggered not at the promise of God. I hope you're getting it. I hope you're taking note of this. I hope you're looking at it. I hope you, I hope you people are seeing this. Through unbelief, there's the opposite of belief, but was strong in what? Strong in faith, giving glory to God. And I don't know, maybe... It appears that five times in three verses, the emphasis is on belief, as, a, as opposed to unbelief mentioned once. So you could say six times the emphasis is, is on belief. And we also see the belief contrasted with what Abraham looked at, looked at, such as the deadness of Sarah's womb, I, I don't know how to tell you how precious this book is. Everything, everything in these next few verses that speak of the response of Abraham's faith is centered in the Word of God. And Folks, if you don't have a solid standing on God's inerrant word, you don't have a solid foundation on which to work. He believed God. He had no reason to believe God because everything Everything that Abraham saw said it, it couldn't be true. Hello? 
I, I know, I, I hope I touched a spiritual nerve with some of you out there. It, if you look at people who profess to be Christians today, the lives that they live, Somebody asked me recently, can a Christian do this? You know, well, a Christian can do anything the flesh can do. I, I, I personally believe that the Christian can take the flesh for a ride anytime he wants to. But that does not mean he's not God's child. And the natural human response is... Wait a minute. You're, you're wait a minute. You're you're saying that no matter how I live, I'm God's child and I'm headed for heaven. I, I'm saying that. Well, I, I'm not saying that. God is. Uh, and if you say if you say that that isn't true, then then the promise isn't certain to all the seed. You know there. Uh, there are some seed that did something that caused them to be uh, yanked out of the promise. And as a whole, that is what the modern religious human merit based system today believes. Let's jump ahead from Abraham to you here. That's, there's, that's quite a distance in between. And remind ourselves of what the same Paul, the same author, human author, says when it comes to our present relationship to God. All right? Look at 2 Corinthians 4.18. 2 Corinthians 4.18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal but the things which are not seen are eternal. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, 7. For, this is a very familiar verse to most of us. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Sounds like Abraham to me. What if Abraham had walked by sight? Please don't come to me saying, Steve, you shouldn't teach people they can do anything they want to and go to heaven. Dearly beloved, if you are not already sinning more than you want to, I wonder if you know the Lord who died in your place. I believe being a new creation in Christ Jesus changes the wants. I didn't change them. I, I didn't change them because I wanted to earn heaven. They just changed because I was born from above. I mean, little boys, they leave little games as they grow up. It just happens with growth. What I really want, what I really, really want is not to sin at all. One of the glories of heaven is that I'll never sin against my Savior again. Don't throw some carnal statement up to me. You are preaching people can live any way they want. And it doesn't matter how they live, blah, you know, blah, blah, blah. Go. Dearly beloved, my heart already breaks over the sin that I see in my life. You need to stand on the Word of God. Abraham believed God. More and more, I see Christians believing science and believing philosophy and believing logic and believing this YouTuber over here or believing this dream or this or whatever or changing the name of their God to chance. I can't imagine a thinking person willing to admit that chance can do a better job than the almighty God. 
And there is no truth separate from this book, from the Word of God. It's not in science. It's not in history. It's not in philosophy. It's not in logic. It's in the Word of God. He believed God. Who is this God? Well, he's the one that can call life out of death. He made you a new creation in Christ Jesus. You were dead in sin. He made you alive. He did that by his word. He did that by his word. You couldn't do it. You can't resurrect yourself to life. You can't raise yourself to life and make yourself a new creation. He calls those things which are not as though they were. We can't do that. If we did that, we'd be lying. I know some people right now, I watch them on TV a lot, they're doing that very thing. I'm not going to mention names. What that, what that says of God is that he controls the future. My times are in his hands. My steps are ordered of the Lord. After I've suffered a while, he will establish, strengthen, and settle me. No matter what man does to me, he will not leave nor forsake me. Those are marvelous promises. I believe God. And I hope you do too. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're just thankful for the privilege and the opportunity that we've had just to, to think about your word. May the Holy Spirit just take what's been said and filter it so that truth grips our hearts. In Christ's name, I pray. Amen. This is Steve. I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for watching.